All right, hello and welcome to the latest edition of Parallel. I'm Perry M. Boring, the founder and president of the Chamber of Digital Commerce, and we are thrilled to have you join us today for a discussion about Bitcoin and digital asset exchange traded funds. Now, since 2013, there have been dozens of issuers that have sent various digital asset ETF proposals to the SEC. Uh, many of the, these have not been successful. Um, but just a few weeks ago, um, or as of just a few weeks ago, we now have futures Bitcoin exchange traded products available to U.S. investors. Um, and to all of our keen interests, this was approved um, before a spot Bitcoin ETF. Uh, there is a lot of pent up demand for a spot Bitcoin ETF in the U.S. today, so much so that we're now starting to see issuers go to other jurisdictions to try to bring these products to U.S. investors. <clears throat> we have a number of industry um, ETF experts with us here today to talk about the current crypto and digital asset ETF landscape. We're going to discuss some of the key obstacles that companies are facing and potential ways that we can overcome these challenges together as an industry, as a community. Um, our panel of experts inc includes Craig Salm from Grayscale, Ryan LaVar from Wisdom Tree, Catherine Dowling from Bitwise, Andrew Siegel from Galaxy Digital, John Key from Valerie, and Kyle uh, DeCruz from Van Eck. Uh, and today's um, event is co-hosted between Cliff Cohn from uh, Clifford Chance and Morrison Warren from Chapman and Cutler. Morrison, I'm gonna hand it over to you to jump into our conversation today. Fantastic, Ariane. This is super exciting to have this fantastic panel available to talk about this issue that's so near and dear to all of us. Um, I, I think I wanna get started with Craig and the first question and thought is where are we and how did we get here with regards to um, the development of trying to have a publicly offered listed uh, crypto ETF? Yeah, thank you, Morrison. And uh, as Perry Ann pointed out, you know, the Bitcoin ETF process started all the way back in 2013, which was only a couple of years after Bitcoin itself was invented. And the first filing was from the Lungavas twins with their Bitcoin trust. And it wasn't really until you fast forward to 2017 when you had Grayscale along with many other panelists on today's panel with ETF applications for both ETFs that hold physical or spot Bitcoin. So that's the underlying asset as well as Bitcoin futures, which is a derivative of Bitcoin and trades on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, for instance. And at that time, the SEC denied both physical slash spot and futures-based ETF filings. The reasons they cited for denying both types of ETFs was because of what they perceived to be fraud and manipulation in the underlying spot markets. And if your view is that there's any sort of fraud and manipulation taking place on the underlying spot markets, then it really does make sense to deny both types of ETF applications because both types of products are priced based on those underlying markets. So that's the Coinbase's, the Kraken's, the Gemini's of the world. And in those denials, the SEC was very clear on what they would need to see to be comfortable with approving either a futures or a spot-based ETF. And the two things they cited were one, proof that the Bitcoin markets are inherently resistant to fraud and manipulation. Um, and then the second one was in the absence of being able to prove that, that there's a quote regulated market of significant size such that if there is any fraud and manipulation, it could be detected and deterred and or prosecuted. And so an example of a regulated market would be something like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, because that's regulated more like a commodities futures exchange or a national securities exchange, which is in contrast to an underlying Bitcoin spot exchange. And so that was the state of things in 2017. Over the years, many applicants have been in meetings with the SEC to present arguments of why they thought the markets were ready for a, you know, a futures or a spot-based ETF. Bitwise uh, was certainly really in, you know, instrumental in those efforts and came out with a really great research report proving that a lot of Bitcoin trading, despite having high numbers and volumes on non-US or less regulated exchanges, really was taking place on a lot of the US and more regulated exchanges. But ultimately the SEC had not yet been persuaded by those arguments. And then if we fast forward to 2021, a couple of things changed. 
we had a change of administration and therefore a new chair of the SEC, as well as a difference in view from the commission on the types of Bitcoin ETFs that they would now be comfortable with. Specifically, we started to hear over the summer that the commission might be more, more receptive to a futures-based ETF, specifically if it held the CME Bitcoin futures. And then if you fast forward a couple of months, we actually saw the first futures-based Bitcoin ETF to start trading along with several others, followed by a subsequent denial of a couple of spot-based ETFs. So that really takes us to today. Um, and I'll let the you know, rest of the panelists cover uh, what has happened since then. Right, that's an impressive summary of the entire state of play in less than five minutes. Well done. I got in less than um, five minutes. Thank you, Claire. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned the the, the the SEC's denial of, of the recent spot orders, and um, we have obviously Wisdom Tree and Van Eck on on the uh, on the call today. And perhaps I could hand it over to to, to Ryan and then Kyle. What have we learned, if anything, um, about the SEC's view of, of the spot market? Um, that might help us push this forward as we think about next steps with getting a spot ETF listed. Yeah, so I think, you know, if we step back and um, look at the process itself, um, you know, really the focus is on, you know, listing the ETF shares and traditionally under an ETF, um, you know, there are generic listing standards that have been approved by the Securities and Exchange Commission that the vast majority of ETFs list under. Um, here, uh, for a spot Bitcoin ETF, there aren't those generic listing standards. So essentially what the listing exchange needs to do is put forward a proposal um, of listing standards and articulate reasons why the ETF should be approved uh, under a specific rule, Rule 19 before, uh, that's frequently cited as part of this process. Um, you know, under that, and Craig articulated uh, some of the reasons for the, for the rejection, but you know, really uh, what the exchange is trying to articulate is that that 19 before application has rules that are designed to prevent fraudulent acts and manipulative practices and to protect investors and in the public interest. Um, and Craig touched on a few important points um, that have really helped, I think, at least in, in the exchanges and the sponsor's eyes, move the ball forward in the past year that I think will become even more important as we continue the process. And that is um, you know, that there has grown this CME Bitcoin futures market, um, a regulated market uh, that's become significant size that has surveilling, surveillance sharing agreements in place um, to potentially meet that standard. Um, that's gonna continue to be a focus, um, particularly uh, as was articulated that the SECs approved the Bitcoin futures ETFs um, in saying that, that those can be allowed that utilize CME Bitcoin futures. Um, and really the underlying price source for those Bitcoin futures are those particular exchanges, um, Bitcoin spot exchanges. Um, you know, in Wisdom Tree's case in particular, um, we're using the exact same pricing mechanism for our spot Bitcoin ETF that is the uh, mechanism that uh, is used for the CME Bitcoin futures. And so, you know, by its nature, if one would say that those Bitcoin exchanges or the market in general is subject to fraud and manipulation, yet that's the price source for a Bitcoin spot ETF. Um, and, and why can't that then work if it works for a Bitcoin futures ETF? So that'll continue to, I think, be an important argument. Um, learned a lot more about that in these disapproval orders. Um, but I think fundamentally, it'll go back to investor protection, that sort of second prong, um, and really articulating sort of why the spot Bitcoin ETF serves important investor protection mechanisms. Um, you know, we've articulated a number of arguments there as of other ETF sponsors, really well-crafted arguments to describe why, and particularly as the market matured, particularly as the fundamental underlying aspects of a Bitcoin ETF's potential operations have matured, um, that there are investor protection mechanisms in there. So, you know, we're going to continue uh, the dialogue, continue to try to move the ball forward, notwithstanding a disapproval. Um, in what we believe can can ultimately be a, a constructive way in seeking to get there. Yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of what what these other panelists have said. I would say, 
I don't think it was necessarily surprising to me the decision on, on our, our disapproval notice on November 12th. However, I would say my main takeaways were the inconsistencies in the standards they're applying across the Bitcoin ETP versus other historical ETPs, such as those in dry bulk shipping or in precious metals. So I think these standards are not being applied consistently. And I think there could be a case there to further that and improve that case out. Kyle, you can't be serious. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, based upon what Kyle said, what, what are the other reactions to, to the way that the SEC has, you know, I think Ryan said it, comfortable with, with futures. It's odd that you're not comfortable with spot. I mean, I personally think comparison to other asset classes is not necessarily fair. Things like gold, things like oil, oil futures, those are commodities that have been around for thousands of years. And even those ETFs took several years to get approvals from the first day the filings were made to the first day of trading, whereas something like Bitcoin was invented only, I'll call it 11 years ago. And in that sense, I think it's understandable that it would take the commission time to get comfortable with the asset, get comfortable with where it trades. Bitcoin, unlike other commodities, trades all over the world 24-7 on some marketplaces that are quite regulated, like the U.S. exchanges, and on the other end of the spectrum, markets that are less or not regulated at all. And those are just things that the commission needs time to get comfortable with. But I do think the fact that they're now seemingly okay with futures-based ETFs given, as Ryan pointed out, that some of these spot ETF filings use the exact same exchanges to price their products, meaning that to the extent that you do think there is any fraud and manipulation, it would have to affect the spot and the futures-based ETFs. And if futures ETFs are now trading, we have to presume that they therefore should be okay with the spot-based ETFs. You know, I'd like to move it to, for us to think about the fact that other jurisdictions have approved these products, and in particular Canada, there, there are both Spot Bitcoin and, and Ether ETFs. Andrew at uh, Galaxy Digital, you all have worked um, in Canada to bring these products, and I'm wondering, you know, are there is there anything to what the SEC is saying with regards to the investor protection concerns? I, I believe that uh, in Canada. Uh, everyone got over those issues and, and trading has been good and the products have worked. Um, what are your thoughts with regards to the, the SEC's perception regarding these issues? Thank you, Morrison. I, I am uh, you know, very much aware of what's going on in Canada. Galaxy Digital has partnered with CI Financial, um, a independent asset management uh, firm and fund provider since 1965 to provide, you know, both the Bitcoin uh, spot ETF and, and as we mentioned, ETH uh, spot ETF. We weren't the first on the Bitcoin uh, side. That was uh, 3IQ and, and they had to pursue, you know, pretty much a litigation to get uh, the OSC, the Ontario Securities Commission comfortable. But the panel decision, if you read that, um, that came out in 2019, it was in October 2019, is really um, amazing now to look back on and look at what the panel considered in terms of the concerns that the SEC is raising in some of these other uh, cases. Now, I should note that the Canadian process is very different. Uh, it isn't the same kind of 19 before application process, but the, the panel did look at things like um, the volume uh, in the trading uh, in Bitcoin and on exchanges. They looked at the dollar size. They looked at liquidity. They looked at um, they looked at reliable price discovery in in the in the in the markets. Um, and they also you know took uh, a lot of comfort in the fact that a number of the exchanges and OTC desks that are traded are regulated um, under a very you know, um, serious set of laws set out by New York State called the bit license. And, and it's fascinating that these are things that you know, our neighbors to the north are looking for towards for protection, but our own you know, SEC is not you know, acknowledging that, that these exist and that you know, uh, New York being a, a tough regulator in this space, as we've seen, you know, is, uh, they're not giving weight to that. I think in our own experience, 
Um, we went through a lot of due diligence with our partner, um, with the regulators. We uh, also, you know, have based our pricing off of the uh, Bloomberg Galaxy Bitcoin index, which is something that we partnered with them, but is entirely run by uh, Bloomberg now. And Bloomberg has some, you know, extensive due diligence that they do on the pricing sources, et cetera. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, information and, and uh, integrity in the process. And, and as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's working well in Canada. It works working so, so well that there's a number of mutual funds, including, you know, the ARC uh, Next Generation Internet ETF, which is a SEC regulated mutual fund fund that is permitted to invest in the Canadian ETF. So if it's permitted to invest in that, um, query why, you know, and, and, it, and it's working well, why are we not, you know, seeing a product like this in the U.S., a spot Bitcoin ETF? One last thing I'll say just on this is that a lot of people, you know, forget that there is a fourth pillar to the SEC uh, in terms of, you know, what it stands for. You know, historically, it was all about efficiency, competition, um, capital. I'm sorry, it was it, the original uh, pillars were uh, protecting investors, maintaining orderly markets, and facilitating capital formation. In 1996, Congress introduced um, competition as, as a fourth pillar for the SEC. And, you know, there's competition in Canada and um, it's working well. And I think that the SEC should pay attention to that um, and you know, take note of that, uh, of that fourth pillar that they should be looking at. And Andrew, I, I just briefly add, we, uh, we just passed the two year anniversary in Europe um, you know, of the uh, Wisdom Tree you know, Bitcoin exchange trader product in Europe. And, and similarly, um, you know, really you know, operating without instant, instant incident or, or performance issues. And, you know, providing access to spot Bitcoin at, at essentially the price of spot Bitcoin. So without deviations and premium or discounts. So I think those types of aspects is, you know, incredibly important in thinking about, you know, what investors want and how they might access it. And, and as Andrew noted, we have, you know, history and now, you know, worldwide, essentially history of, of good performing products, providing investors exactly the type of access they want you know, without, without surprises associated with that access. So, um, you know, I think that's an important part of the dialogue too, as, as Andrew pointed out. There have been, uh, as we all know, there have been consistent issues raised regarding these products, including custody, valuation, potential for market man manipulation. Um, but it's really interesting that in these jurisdictions where the products exist, none of these things have occurred yet. Now, that won't necessarily carry the day, but, but it is good evidence. Maybe I'll, um, I'll, I'll throw this over to, to Craig and, and given the fact that Grayscale's counsel, Davis Polk, um, submitted a comment to, to the current 19B4 application uh, that would list your, your Bitcoin fund. There are a number of arguments within that letter that our audience may not be familiar with. And, and we were hoping you could um, perhaps summarize some of the strongest arguments you're, you're putting forth to help move the needle here. And then um, let's hear what some of the other uh, panelists think about it as well. Yeah, so in connection with the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust ETF application under Form 19B4, like any 19B4 filing, what that does is open up a comment period for anybody to send in a letter to the commission, either arguing for or against the particular application. Anybody can do this from some individual sitting in their home to Grayscale's lawyers at Davis Polk. And the particular letter that Cliff is referring to is a new argument that our attorneys at Davis Polk made last week in the context of Bitcoin ETFs. It's a new argument because as I mentioned, before 2021, we had both futures and spot-based Bitcoin ETFs being denied. And that made sense because in the context of Bitcoin ETFs, they're both like products where if the concern is fraud and manipulation in the underlying spot markets, then you're going to have to disapprove both types of ETFs. But fast forwarding to 2021, when we had the first futures-based ETF start trading, well, now we have a situation of two like products, a futures-based ETF and spot-based ETFs being treated dissimilarly. 
and under something called the Administrative Procedure Act, you're not allowed to do that. So our attorneys at Davis Polk sent in a letter to the commission arguing that by approving futures-based ETFs but not spot-based ETFs, there's a potential violation of the APA. And a couple of the arguments that were cited there were references to the Investment Company Act of 1940 being one of the reasons for approving futures-based ETFs versus spot-based ETFs is really a misplaced argument in the context of ETF approvals. The reason being that the Investment Company Act of 1940, which regulates futures-based ETFs, but not spot-based ETFs, is really focused on the management of ETFs as opposed to the underlying assets or the markets for those assets. Meaning the Investment Company Act is not regulating the Coinbase's or the Kraken's or the Gemini's of the world. So that's not really a persuasive argument for why you should be treating these two types of ETFs differently. Another reason that's often cited is that because the CME Bitcoin futures are, tra are trading on the commodity, or I'm trading on the, sorry, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is more regulated than a Bitcoin exchange, that has been cited as a reason for treating these two differently. But again, if you look at the reasons why ETFs have been disapproved to date, the commission has even cited the CME futures market as not being significant enough in the context of ETFs. So what that means is, you know, fraud and manipulation could take place outside of the CME markets and still impact those Bitcoin futures. So those are two persuasive arguments we think that we have. It's a process that we started in the context of our 19 before. It's also an argument that any spot-based ETF filer can make. And we're looking forward to seeing what the commission's response to this. Maybe I'll, um, I'll, I'll ask Craig, um, you know, the Administrative Procedure Act, it's a fairly high bar. If you were to theoretically take the SEC into the DC circuit and say, these guys have um, violated the APA. Um, and I, I guess, you know, we, no one really wants to see it go in that direction. Um, is there anything else you think as an industry others can do to, to help push this forward? Yeah, so you know the great thing about the 19 before process is, as I said, anybody can submit comment letters in. The commission is required to review them, acknowledge them, respond to them in any subsequent approval or disapproval orders. And so we're looking forward to seeing the response to that letter. And I would encourage anybody on this call to send in supportive letters as well, arguing why you think the commission should be approving spot-based ETFs. And this isn't just for the grayscale Bitcoin trust ETF, it's for all the other folks in this call, as well as all the other issuers out there that have spot-based filings. So yeah, that's a really important point. I mean, what you just said shouldn't be understated. The SEC, what, what, when responding, has to confront the arguments yeah. made by commentators. They, they can't just dismiss them. Um, and, if, and if people are making similar arguments, it's even harder for the SEC to, to brush them aside without some underlying logic, coherent uh, rationale. Yep. So I'd like to move to the, the products that were approved. We've had a couple wins, um, which is fortunate. There, there are three um, Bitcoin futures based funds that are out there. Fortunately, we have two folks who work with shops that have brought those products. John Key is with Valkyrie and Kyle DeCruz is with Van Eck. And, and both those shops also are looking for a spot based fund. I just thought it'd be interesting to talk through what it means um, to have a listed um, Bitcoin based product that's in the marketplace. Like John, for instance, you know, what has been the sort of the reception of the product uh, in the marketplace? And have you guys had um, a, a lot of, uh, let's say, interest and success in bringing the product? Uh, th thanks, Morrison. Um... Yeah, first of all, thank you for having us on this panel as the non-legal person here. <laughs> I'm uh, privileged to be on with uh, the, my colleagues and peers. Um, yeah, Valkyrie was very fortunate that we were able to launch the fund. Uh, we worked long and hard on it, so it wasn't without a lot of hard work and a lot of time and energy spent on this. Um, we are, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of interest in the product, obviously, with the success of the power shares launch, which was uh, a blowout as the largest Bitcoin ETF, uh, largest ETF ever launched. Um, 
our phone was number 14 on the list of top launches. So on an absolute basis, not quite the power share size, but on a relative basis, uh, quite significant. Uh, so I think that in and of itself underscores the demand and uh, the desire for investors to, to have some way to access uh, the Bitcoin market. Uh, this, the funds have been doing great. Uh, our, our futures ETF trades with a, a very tight spread, which is one of the things that you want to see over time. Uh, it's been about a penny spread overall. Um, in speaking with advisors, I would say the majority of advisors are very pleased that a product like this is out there. Uh, prior to the launch of the three futures-based ETFs, uh, they were, you know, they were struggling to find a solution for themselves and for their for their clients on how to access this market. Today, you have a product that's familiar. An ETF is a familiar format, comfortable with it. It's held in custody. Uh, there's plenty of liquidity, regulated uh, exchange that people are, are, are again comfortable with. And so uh, I, I think these products will continue to grow over time. Um, you know, interest in the product, you know, gold, the GLD as an example, started out pretty quickly, got to a billion dollars and then kind of topped out. And uh, today is an $84 billion fund. So we, we think, you know, future, futures based and or spot products uh, will, will absolutely have a lot of interest in the marketplace. All of the advisors that we're talking to are expressing an interest in a spot product as a next evolution or iteration. Uh, clearly, the futures product is important in, in terms of context because it is a stepping stone to what we all are striving for here on this call and among this industry, uh, which is to have a spot Bitcoin ETF uh, available in the marketplace sometime in the future. And, and John. One of the arguments made in the 19B4 application seeking approval of a spot a Bitcoin ETF was that it perhaps, you know, that is a better way through an exchange listed product to actually purchase um, um, exposure to Bitcoin for many investors. Has it, has it proven uh, to be the case? And, and, and what are some of the benefits you see in terms of owning um, your current product versus some of the other means by which folks are get exposure to Bitcoin? Yeah, it's a great question, Morrison. So um, prior to the ETF being available, as we all know, uh, you could open up an account with Gemini or Base and, and go through the process of, you know, going. Um, there are inherent risks, as I'm sure has been discussed and you guys are all familiar with, with regard to security and losing your keys and getting hacked and other things like that. Um, there's very little guidance in terms of which coins or tokens people should buy other than Bitcoin, for example. So, uh, you know, there, that tends to be some somewhat problematic for investors and advisors. Um, again, as I said earlier, this is a product that advisors and investors are familiar with. It's an ETF product. It's exchange traded. Uh, you know what you're, you're getting. Is it a perfect product? It's not but it does provide investors in sort of the broadband of, if you look at the investor ecosystem, uh, you know, you have the institutional buyers on top who can already, you know, go off platform and invest in a variety of different ways and gain direct exposure to Bitcoin. You have the do-it-yourselfers, you know, sort of in, this, in the third tier, Uh, who are you using, you know, whether, whether it's PayPal, that middle market, RIA, uh, wirehouse platform of, of and, and investors that are looking for a simple, uh, easy solution to gain exposure to this asset class and its, its potential appreciation over the long term, uh, which Great. And, and Kyle, um, I would love to ask you, 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 all, you guys have, have obviously have a Bitcoin futures product. You're also interested in the spot par product. Could you compare the two um, and also talk to, um, you know, ultimately, hopefully we get a spot, a spot product. You know, where, what will these two products sit side by side and will they appeal to two different audiences? 
Yeah, I think so. Look, I think we've been consistent in our messaging over time is that we feel the spot product is a superior product as it relates to a futures-based ETF or, or a fiscal-based ETF. There are a multitude uh, way of ways to access Bitcoin. Uh, I think each individual investor needs to consider their needs. So uh, certainly the physical is going to be the better wedding, but through a 40 act future space ETF, that may be first access now, of course, they can access that now. And second, to a lot of the reasons that John just mentioned is that ease of convenience, et cetera. However, the downside to that is the negatives that come along with using futures based products. So primarily the contango or the roll yield aspect. So in bull markets, you can see a, a large drawdown uh, due to the, the negative roll yield, the contango market. And that's primarily when the front month contracts are, are going to be sold at a lower price than, than the future contracts. And, and just a question, since we've been across the line with a, B, a Bitcoin future fund, well, what about Ether? You know, is, is there any demand out there in the marketplace for Ether um, and some of the obstacles associated with bringing another product a, a, along the same path? And I'll start with Kyle then, and then follow with John. Yeah, I, th I think there is. Uh, and I think that's going to continue into 2022 and beyond. Um, however, you're going to see the same situations as you are with, with bringing a Bitcoin product to market. And so I think if you looked at the Bitcoin futures history, it was kind of a slow progression where they allowed a closed end fund, they allowed some funds to invest a small portion of Bitcoin futures, and then eventually they allowed a full Bitcoin futures fund. I think you're gonna see a similar uh, uh, path forward for Ether and, and other cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I would, I would add to that, Morris. And uh, look, Valkyrie is a RIA. We are talking to advisors and uh, RIA shops, platforms, independents uh, across the board. We have lots and lots of conversations every day. We're helping them on the educational side in terms of understanding this market and how to best deploy it and what allocations might mean. Uh, and so as part of those discussions, we do get quite a few questions about other um, ways invest in crypto including ethereum which is this you know is the best known a product that would eventually come to market would have probably as much appeal as a bitcoin the futures bitcoin product has had so far and what a spot product would have even further to that uh we think an ethereum based product would be uh well very well would go on our interest and uh, I think a lot of investment, and it would it would be uh, grow that be, uh, the the more the more tokens we could bring to the market, the more we could educate people on how they work, why they should invest in them, what the nuances are between Bitcoin and Ethereum, because they are very very different. Uh, I, I think that would be important to sort of raising the level of awareness and and um, you know building on the the just the knowledge of the crypto digital asset space overall. You know, Ethereum. I think the SEC seems to be a little bit hesitant with it at this moment, um, just because the trading uh, and the on the CME tends to be a little bit more clunky, maybe than the Bitcoin futures. Um, but I think over time that that smooths itself out, and and we we will probably see a product in that space as well. And Cliff and Morris, I just want to say that this panel started off with you know the sort of tone of well, where is the spot Bitcoin ETF? But I think it's important to you know, take a step back and realize how big of a step forward it was to see the first Bitcoin futures ETF start trading. That's something that's been uh, almost a decade in the works. And I think that should be celebrated for the commission's willingness to take that step forward. And now I think we all agree that the next step forward is for a spot-based ETF. But you know, I personally believe, and I think all the panelists also would agree, the more ways that investors can access Bitcoin, whether it's through underlying markets, through futures, through futures ETF, a spot, a spot based ETF, an SMA, what have you, that's just better for investor choice. And that's really the things that we're all here to help support. I'm, I'm gonna go off piece for one, for one moment because I, you, you kind of raised it a bit, Craig, indirectly, but the, and I agree, the SEC has made, made a lot of progress here and you know, the, the futures product helps to, I think, legitimize an asset class that, that, that should be legitimized. 
Um, from an investor protection standpoint, how important do you think it was that the futures ETFs fit into a 40 act structure? Um, we, we know the SEC is focused uh, on investor protection. We know how critical that is. And, I, and I've often wondered, um, you know, looking at the 40 act structure, do you think they put too much weight on that as an investor protection mechanism in this asset class? And, maybe, and that was clearly helpful to get the futures product across the line. Um, but do we need to do more work and education to explain why, yes, 40 act products are great, uh, they're the highest form of consumer protection in the asset management industry to some degree, but 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 it's not as necessary here um, because of the way this asset operates and you know the unique features of a of a 33 act ETF. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would say the 40 act certainly has additional investor protection that the 33 act doesn't necessarily require necessarily require, but those are things like accounting and borrowing and custody and independence of your board of directors, which are all good things to have, but in the context of a Bitcoin ETF, I don't think they necessarily have the added necessary protections that make the difference between being comfortable with a futures-based ETF, but not a spot-based ETF. Cliff, I'll Cliff. jump. I'll, I'll yeah, jump for a moment too, Cliff. Um, let's, yeah. also point, let's also point out that investors are buying these products right now, and we have a better option with better protections through a spot Bitcoin ETF than how a majority of current investors are actually buying this product. So if we're focused on investor protections, we have to think about it in those terms as well. And you know, Craig mentioned earlier in, in going through the history of where we were, where we are now, the importance of research and a data-driven approach. And one of the gating items, both then and still now, and we've seen this play out through the 19 before process, is demonstrating that there's a, a market, a significant market, regulated market of significant size. And I think the more we can work together as a group to continue to give the commission the research to show that there is a safe market, the CME market, it's regulated. It's why we have the 40 Act product as the first one out of the gate, because Gensler's very concerned with end-to-end -end regulation. He's already expressed a number of concerns since he's taken office about trading venues, spot exchanges. The more we can allay those concerns with a data-driven research approach, give that information, work together, and have those communications, I think we'll get past the kind of guinea, guinea pig first product of this futures product that's you know regulatorily wrapped. It's it's just it's the safer product to first come out with. And as Craig aptly pointed out, we should celebrate that moment. It's a moment to be celebrated. There were questions before this product was approved. Is there even a market for it? Well, we see we see that in fact there is a huge market for it. But we still want the holy grail and we should get to the holy grail. And a lot of the panelists have aptly pointed out the number of inconsistencies with having one and not the other. But I think if we do look at it as a first product out of the gates, a guinea pig again, if you will, and compare it, as Andrew was pointing out, to some of the markets outside the U.S., we will see that there's research and there's data in there that we can use to push forward because I don't think we all want to wait for another, you know, two years until we get a um, get an approach from Congress that will give uh, the SEC the clarity that uh, that Gensler's been asking for or saying he needs with regard to gaps and which which regulatory body is going to be focused there. Uh, but again, circling back, it's the research. We just have to keep pushing the research. And Bitwise has spent over two years with multiple white papers. We've put them out there in the ether, no pun intended. We put them out there to the, to the public to make those available so that more can be done on top of that research so that we can push forward and get investors the best product, which is the, ET, the, spot, B, the spot ETF. Yeah, Cliff, I would, I would just add to that. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I would just I would just add on, on your question about the 40 act versus the 33 act. Clearly, creating a 40 act fund, which is also a 33 act vehicle, well, it's a 33 40 act vehicle. It, it's definitely a belt and suspender solution. Uh, I mean, you know, the SEC wanted to go all out and have every layer of possible protection that they could have on this product. 
a 33 act fund would have been a much more cleaner, a much more efficient product to manage. Um, there are some complexities by creating a 40 act, well, from clunky before, it's a little bit more clunky, but um, you know, again, to have the ability to get the stepping stone and to make this first foray into a publicly traded retail product that investors can own, uh, as both Catherine and, and Craig have, have, have stated, is is a major milestone um, in, in the right direction. I I don't think I answered Morris's correct question fully earlier um, about the comparison between this and a Bitcoin. It's all it's all been stated, but from our perspective, clearly that would be the most desirable end result would be to get a, an ETF or an ETP that can own Bitcoin directly. Um, that would be the ultimate solution. And I agree with Catherine, getting, getting the data out there, getting the research out there uh, that we at Valkyrie are also working diligently on. We've admired all the work that Bitwise has done over the years. We think it's tremendous work and all the other participants here. Uh, and, and we're trying to follow down that path too, to make that case that you know, if you if you do the work, if you do the research, if you do the analysis, you will come to the conclusion that if you can approve, if you approve the current product, there's no reason that you can't make that leap of faith into the spot product. Yeah, and and for, I guess you know, wisdom tree. I mean, we you know live and breathe forty act ETFs every day. Um, you know, when we were looking at you know launching product a couple of years ago, I mean, it's the type of rigor that we looked at from each core aspect of the operations in terms of you know, having a tenant team, you know, visiting the Bitcoin custodians in person, you know, pre-COVID um, to really understand their operations, you know, hot versus cold storage. But it's the type of rigor that we bring to a 40 act product. And so, you know, I think that, you know, that's the type of rigor that, you know, sponsors are looking to bring is, you know, the, these are products, and especially since we have them in the marketplace operating well in other jurisdictions, under you know rigorous standards, um, you know those standards can be applied in many ways. Whether or not they're you know statutorily applied, can be applied. I think to you know the spot Bitcoin ETF in ways that you know should provide a, a mechanism and a, a a way to invest that that is investor protection friendly. Yeah, it's, I think it's interesting. Chairman Ginsler has expressed a preference for forty act funds, but Bitcoin is not a security, and so therefore you can't really construct a 40 act fund with just bitcoin um and so you have this dilemma there uh, you know one one thing to think about some of those protections you could actually build into a 33 act product and 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 that may be a sort of a path forward to help bridge some of the issues you could have a board of trustees if you wanted right an independent board you could be as focused on custody um, that you would be if you were an investment company preclude um, affiliated transactions and you know maybe that's a middle ground as it relates to the structure we still have to get over the the sort of the non-acceptance of spot bitcoin but but perhaps a, a sort of a middle ground with regards to the way these products are structured to make a difference. Morrison, you read my mind. I mean, I, 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 I'm glad you raised that point. Um, Bitcoin is not a security and, and therefore you can't do a 40 act ETP where you just hold Bitcoin. And, and Catherine, I'd like to kind of to, to draw you into this because um, Bitwise obviously has a slightly different strategy where you, where you, Combine digital assets, and you've done so in a in a goal that that is a 34 act reporting company um, filing 34 act statements and sold you know via private placements. How how do you think about the regulatory issues around creating products in this space? And you know, I, I think when we're talking about Bitcoin, when we're talking about Ether, I think the industry seems comfortable that those are not securities. But some of the other digital assets, it's not as clear. Um, how does that factor into your decision making when you're designing products? Well, Cliff, it's a good question. If you back up actually and look at the larger picture, because this actually ties into the, the spot Bitcoin ETF and when we get it, one of the concerns that the commission has raised is the, the trading venues and looking at those trading venues, trying to ascertain, well, who has, who who's regulating them, right? If they're, if they are in fact trading securities, then the SEC can step in. And when Gensler initially testified before Congress, he expressed an interest in Congress stepping in and helping fill that gap. 
Now shift forward a little bit, you're hearing a little bit of a change in that dialogue and statements have been more along the lines of, well, you have these exchanges, if they're trading you know, 50 to 100 tokens, surely some of those are securities. So there you have the SEC, SEC hook, right? If they're trading securities, they can step in. But again, we come back to the trading venues and concern around those exchanges. If we can help get some more data and push the research on making there be more of a case for comfort around those exchanges. Again, pointing out the inconsistencies that, that Craig raised earlier, that the futures product is out there, it ties back to those spot exchanges. The, the securities aspect is a Pandora's box and it's begging for clarity. Uh, again, you have uh, Chairman Gensler out there saying that it's clear, the Howey test is clear. Um, he says, you can go through and, and do the test. You've got sparring with Congress saying it's not clear. And then you have other, you know, you have Commissioners Persh stepping out and saying, hey, we're seeing so many no action letters. We can't say this is clear, right? I mean, you've seen the, the release with regard to uh, the coin schedule matter, which I thought was really interesting and, uh, you know, a call to action. So your, your question is, is a good one and it's a big one. And we do need more clarity around the security definition. And we need that clarity so that operators in the space can know when they're operating in a, in a way that's regulatorily compliant or not. And right now you have a situation where you can't get uh, an attorney. I'm sure Cliff and Morrison, if, if one of your companies said, hey, will you, will you write a legal opinion and put your name on it saying that X, Y, or Z is or is not a security, you're not gonna step in and do that. That's not clarity. And we need that clarity, especially in the space that is evolving so quickly from a technological standpoint and from you know, digital asset, asset standpoint, platforms are evolving. That clarity is in incredibly important and, and we don't have it, but we have two sides saying we do, sides saying we don't. And that's really a big part of the dialogue that needs to get moved forward with all of us. Catherine, I think you've raised some great points. And, and one of the questions I have is what can be done, right? The, the research that, that Bitwise put forward was fantastic, you know, in terms of supporting the idea that a spot Bitcoin fund is appropriate for now. It was great. But, you know, is, is, that, is that sufficient, right? It, can it be sufficient when you keep hearing that regulation of the underlying exchanges is, is, is critical for, for a spot Bitcoin product? And I, I would love to take take your old temperature as to whether you think there is a, a way without um, having registered um, exchanges involved um, is, you know, can you make the case that there is enough there to get through the Winklevoss test that's been, that's been set up um, for purposes of approving a spot product? You know, I'll start with Ryan if, as to whether Ryan has a, a sense as to, as to next steps. Yeah, I think, you know, I think next step, it, it's really turning, you know, into an individual and collective effort as well. Um, you know, I think each of the ETF sponsors are, are bringing, um, you know, some, some elements to the table, uh, you know, different arguments. I think to answer your question, Morrison, you know, do we think that there's a path forward? I think that probably none of us would be continuing on this journey or dialogue if we didn't think there was a path forward or if, there, if, if that wasn't the right path to end at. Um, and so, you know, we're committed. I, I know others here are committed. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see, you know, I think from us certainly and from, from others, um, you know, continued arguments, uh, you know, trying to make that case, new data, uh, new paths forward, um, you know, hoping to get there. Sure, Andrew. Yeah, I just want to jump in and say that I think uh, the industry has to take some responsibility here as well. You know, first of all, there's Chairman Gensler is not going to get in the near term uh, his wish to regulate these exchanges. Uh, one, you know, we know Bitcoin is traded on them and that's uh, a commodity. And that's already under the purview of, of the CFTC and the NFA, at least in a, in a hindsight way. You know, the CFTC doesn't regulate the spot market, but they do regulate fraud and manipulation in underlying spot markets, or they have the ability to, to uh, issue sanctions, and they have done that in this case, when uh, there is a derivative that they regulate, and here they regulate the futures market. Uh, so they have the ability to step in. 
And I think the industry needs to take it upon itself to come up with some standard setting uh, that they can show the SEC, the CFTC, and others that um, you know there is uh, there there are you know uh, ways that there could be transparency, price discovery, and uh, uh, procedures against fraud and manipulation that the CFTC can then you know um, say they're not going to give their stamp of approval on it but it's going to be consistent with the kind of things that they would be looking at in hindsight and looking at to see that the futures markets are regulated. So I, I think that the, the industry needs to come together and particularly the exchanges. Um, and, and if they want to have uh, this kind of uh, you know, volume that's going to be uh, created through Bitcoin ETFs, there should be some incentive, you know, just. I, I would note that right now um, they do have the market for people accessing Bitcoin um, through through those exchanges. So um, you know they have to see the benefit in that, and I think and I hope they will, and come around to some kind of standard setting. And there's groups out there. Um, some of us are part of that uh, that that are looking to set those standards. You know, you wonder if, if the solution will be from industry, whether it'll be through the regulators or whether it be a political solution. Um, and do you believe that any inroads are being made um, through Congress or, or otherwise that, that may help uh, solve um, the, the issue and get across the line with the spot Bitcoin product? And anyone who has any familiarity with that, with that we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, well, there's a couple of bills that have been proposed in Congress. There's the Token Taxonomy Act, which seeks to categorize various cryptocurrencies, depending on whether they're commodities or securities, utility tokens, and so on. And I think that would be really helpful in determining what level of regulation should the assets have, should the marketplaces that trade those assets have, and that would obviously have spillover effects into ETF approval as well. Um, tomorrow at the House Financial Services Committee, we have a lot of major CEOs and big U.S. platforms coming in, and I think that'll be revealing around what Congress is looking to see from those folks. And we have representation from exchanges, so I would hope that the exchanges could highlight the level of trading surveillance that they've voluntarily implemented on their exchanges, despite not being regulated like a national securities exchange or like a commodities futures exchange. Because I think when you dig deeper into that, you'll see that a lot of the guardrails that the SEC has that they want to see in those marketplaces already exist, just not necessarily under you know, any of the securities laws that apply to those or don't apply to those marketplaces today. So really a consistent theme that we've all been talking about of industry coming together and making it clear the level of guardrails and protection that they have in place to make our regulators comfortable with approving ETFs and any other type of investment vehicle. Do we think that there's um, a role here for the bank asset managers? Uh, you know, to, to, to a degree, they've kind of, I think, been on the sidelines um, and, and all of you have been on the front lines. Um, but, but I also wonder whether you know, the banking regulators are kind of in the background, but we know they've, they've been formulating views and getting up the learning curve. Is there a role for them to play here as well that would be helpful? I mean, the OCC last summer uh, under Brian Brooks came out with a lot of really, um, I would say groundbreaking guidance saying things like banks who custody cryptocurrencies, banks who custody cash on behalf of stablecoin issuers, uh, banks could serve as nodes, so validating blockchain transactions. And all of those things are really important in terms of legitimizing this space. So I would say, at least from the OCC's perspective, which is national banking regulator, um, they've made a lot of inroads in the, in the cryptocurrency industry. And I would hope that that type of guidance continues to stand so that banks can rely on it. Okay, so we, we have a couple of minutes left and, and I'd like all of you to pull out your, your crystal balls um, so we can look into the future. Um, 
you know, as Yogi Berra said, it's hard to make predi predictions, especially about the future. But notwithstanding that comment, uh, I'd like to hear what all of you think the landscape will look like a year from now. I'm kind of picking a year out of out of a hat, but what do you think will be a year from now? Maybe um, maybe I'll start uh, with you, Catherine. Well, I'm hoping that a year from now we've gotten through some some more of the, uh, the 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 research here to push and move the ball forward, and that we have a, a spot Bitcoin ETF. Um, and I think that a lot of the dialogue here today was focused on industry coming together, pointing out some of the guardrails that are already in place, and just coming back to the foundational elements of fraud and manipulation and how we establish that there are in fact protections in place. There are investor protections in place that we can point to, that we can um, grow on top of, show the foundations, expand the expand those foundations, because the, the concerns with fraud and manipulation have been expressed over and over again. And those concerns are real. And those those should be the concerns. At heart, we need and want investors to have protections and to have trust. The, from the protection creates the trust, which also creates better markets for everybody, you know, not just the actors in it, but the folks investing in it, both. It's all intertwined. So we're, we're all working towards and want to be working towards those goals. No one is wanting to skirt them or you know, make them in a lack of clarity, et cetera. We want them to be clear and we want them to be um, part of the trust and fabric of, of, the, of the regulatory scheme. So I think we're all working towards that goal and we should continue to do so. Don't be shy. I'm lighting up, so I'll go. Um, I would say, you know, eventually we will have spot Bitcoin ETFs. It's an inevitability. It's just going to take time. And then we'll have Ethereum ETFs and we'll have ETFs for various other cryptocurrencies out there. Um, Grayscale today manages 16 products and we're committed to bringing all of those to become ETFs. And we're always thinking about many, many more products on the horizon as the cryptocurrency asset class becomes more diversified in terms of different themes like DeFi and gaming and metaverse and all the different types of ways that investors want to gain exposure. So eventually we'll have many ETFs for single cryptocurrencies as well as baskets, depending on whatever the thematic investment that an investor wants exposure to. I, I would echo what Craig is saying. You know, we're at Galaxy, we're preparing uh, a number of private funds. And so what's going to happen in the near term, um, and maybe hopefully in a year we'll have that uh, Bitcoin uh, spot ETF, but in the near term, the access is going to continue for accredited investors, you know, qualified purchasers, wealthy individuals are going to have continued access to these products, to these unique products. Um, and, you know, folks in Canada will have that access and wealthy individuals here will have access to the Canadian products. Um, it really shouldn't be for the SEC to decide, you know, that investors who can go and purchase these assets at a Coinbase today, can't do, th do that through um, an exchange traded product um, that you know, has uh, other protections for them that uh, can you know, send them a tax uh, K-1 or other statement that they can file to pay their taxes more easily. Uh, there's a lot of benefits and it seems like it's, you know, uh, something that uh, SEC should be moving towards more quickly. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've appreciated the, as Craig noted, I mean, the, the steps that, you know, that have been approved this year. I think, you know, if I go back just six months ago, um, you know, I don't think there was any 40 act registered fund or ETF that was allowed to really have any except for maybe the smallest of micro exposure to Bitcoin futures. Um, you know, we'd worked a long time just for an under 5% uh, Bitcoin futures position in one of our ETFs, which, which was allowed and then on the heels of that 100%. So, you know, I do think we're seeing progress. Um, I also think that, you know, the SEC staff is focused on the underlying technology, blockchain technology, which I think is important. Um, you know, we're focused on that, um, you know, as part of overall, you know, really responsible DeFi initiatives. 
Um, so I do think we'll see, you know, hopefully movement on on both fronts, but but certainly um, uh, some great focus on blockchain and some focus on some blockchain enabled products as well, uh, which, which we're certainly, uh, you know, interested in and, and engaged in. Yeah, I think I would just add further to that. And, and again, talking about yeah, would, that, those okay. steps, oh, sorry about that, uh, kind of talking to those steps, I think we will see uh, a fund that has uh, Ethereum futures in it by the end of next year, maybe cheating a little bit, maybe into 2023. And that may be a small position or closed end fund. But I think, again, building on those steps to get to the path where you have a, a 40 act fund investing in Ethereum futures. Yeah, I would, I would, I'll be the caboose here and bring up the rear. Um, look, I, I, I think in, in a year from now, we, we will probably be much further along uh, towards a, uh, a, a from the SEC exactly what it is that they want from a regulatory standard. What is it that we can go back and work with regula re regulators on that can satisfy those those needs and and those wants? Um, I, I think you know every every comment letter has talked about surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. So clearly. The SEC is very focused on that, and I, I think our energies are best focused on targeting how it is that we can resolve that issue. Because this is, to, in my mind, the, the whole regulatory issue and getting regulation around these exchanges, uh, it, it could be something that could be efficient, or it could be something that could take years and years. And if it does, we're, we're, we're going to be having a lot of these conversations over and over again without making a lot of progress. So. Uh, you know, I, I think it's it's just important to focus on what is it that they want. We did that with the futures ETF. We had a 33 act file. They wanted a 40 act. We gave them what they wanted. Is it ideal? No. Is it groundbreaking? Yes. So we we made a major first step here this year. I hope that next year we can all work together and understand exactly what they're asking for, uh, and work with regulators, work with the exchanges, and come to a, a, a an area where everyone is satisfied and we can move forward with a spot product. Well, thank you. That was great. Um, wonderful to have this panel together and, and everyone's thoughts. And, and thank you to my co-presenter, Morrison. Couldn't have done it without you. Thank you, Cliff. Thanks, everyone. This was fantastic. perry -Ann, uh, it's yours. Yeah, thank you so much. I really want to thank Morrison um, and Cliff for co-hosting today's conversation with us. Uh, this was uh, really a fascinating conversation. And just to kind of highlight some of the key points, of one celebrating just the progress that was made this year while we don't we're not where we ultimately want to be with a spot bitcoin etf having these futures etf products out there really was a massive feat to get the sec comfortable with that and um and ultimately i you know i think i i, I agree with with craig's kind of uh closing sentence here of we're going to get a spot etf it isn't it is inevitable we'll also see um ether etfs as well as basket crypto products soon like this is happening um it's a it's a matter of of if um if, if not when um catherine also highlighted on just some of the larger policy conversations and i did just want to kind of close on that uh that the challenge one of the biggest challenges the crypto space has faced is getting clarity on what digital assets are securities and which ones are not and this is an issue we have been working on at the chamber of digital commerce for a number of years and for those who are stakeholders in that conversation we invite you to be a part of our token alliance which is addressing that issue through the courts, working with the SEC and the regulators, as well as taking that um, to Congress. And some of those legislative um, activities were highlighted on today's call as well. And we are also advocating at the chamber for a spot Bitcoin ETF. We do believe this is what's right and what's best for the markets and for investors. Um, again, I wanna thank all of our speakers for joining us today. Really appreciate your insights. Um, and, and, and a big thanks to the co-host and Cliff and Morrison um, for, for moderating today's conversation. Um, well, this um, concludes today's um, program. Um, just one last announcement. Uh, the Chamber will be hosting the DC Blockchain Summit on May 24th in Washington, DC. 
mark your calendars. We'll be sending out some additional information and informal invitations soon. Until next time, uh, you can follow us on social media. Um, on Twitter, you can find us at Digital Chamber. All right, again, thank you and goodbye.